October the 28th, 1927, with the first scheduled international flight by a United States airline. A Fokker tri-motor airplane loaded with mail flew from Key West, Florida and landed one hour and 10 minutes later in Havana, Cuba, a distance of 135 kilometers. Pan Am's 28-year-old founder was the legendary Juan Terry Tripp. It was Tripp's original bright idea that planes carrying mail can just as easily transport people. Putting seats in the back of each plane, he charged $100 to fly to Havana. Tripp was determined that Pan Am would always be the number one US airline. In the post-war world, uh, in the 1960s, uh, Pan American Airlines was one of the big, big names. Most American airlines tended to fly inside America, but Pan Am had built his reputation on flying all around the world. And they did that by always buying the latest and best aircraft. On October the 26th, 1958, Pan Am became the first US airline to operate a jet passenger plane, a Boeing 707 christened Clipper America. It flew from New York to Paris, halving the normal flight time. Juan Tripp was also determined Pan Am would be the first airline to go supersonic. If you joined Pan Am as a pilot in the late 1950s or 1960s, the first thing they told you was, you hang in there guys because you are going to fly supersonic. Pan Am saw that uh, being the first to be with the supersonic airliner as, as, as you know, the, the thing that would brand the company as the place to go. But the Pan Am decision was to trigger an American response. Within days of the announcement, on June the 5th, 1963, President John F. Kennedy proclaimed his government's intention to support the American aircraft industry in developing and building a supersonic transport that American airlines, like Pan Am, could fly. When Kennedy heard the Pan-American were going to buy the European Concorde, he was apoplectic, he was furious, and he phones up the uh, head of uh, Pan Am, uh, Juan Tripp, and just gives him a bowling out. And Tripp says, well, you know, the alternative is you give me an American supersonic airliner. So from that moment on, Kennedy decides he is going to get a hold of the uh, American aircraft companies and he's going to make them build uh, a supersonic airliner faster and higher in performance than the European rival. And so the race began. The immediate result of Kennedy's intervention uh, in the race to build a supersonic transporter was the appropriation of a hundred million dollars worth of funding from Congress, which in 1963 was a serious amount of money. Concorde now had an American rival. The question then became, who was going to build it? One obvious candidate was Douglas, the major builder of civil airliners from the fabled DC-3 to the jet DC-8. But Douglas was too strapped for cash to compete. Other candidates were North American, who were already working on a big supersonic bomber, the B-70 Valkyrie, and Lockheed, which had major experience of supersonic craft, such as the secret SR-71 Blackbird. There was also Boeing, the manufacturer of the mighty B-52 bomber and the well-established 707 airliner series. Of all the American aircraft companies, paradoxically Boeing was the one that had the most trouble in getting into the supersonic airline business. Um, Boeing hadn't actually delivered a supersonic aircraft uh, to anybody. Today, Boeing is the world's largest aerospace company. The company employs close to 200,000 people and serves customers in 145 countries. It generates an annual revenue of nearly $60 billion. But Boeing had humble beginnings. Its founder was William Boeing, the son of a wealthy lumberman. In 1903, Boeing dropped out of Yale University and headed for Washington State to make his fortune in the timber industry. In 1910, William Boeing went to Los Angeles for the first American air meet. He tried to get a ride in one of the airplanes, 
but not one of the dozen pilots participating in the event would oblige. Boeing came back to Seattle, determined to build and fly his own planes. Bill Boeing was, uh, some people think he was an inventor, but Bill Boeing was an innovator of the highest order. Uh, he, I think he has very few patents, perhaps if any, but he would look at a product and he could see where he could make it better. On July the 15th, 1916, Boeing incorporated his airplane manufacturing business in Seattle, in an old boatyard. He hired boat builders whose skills in carpentry were ideal for the new aviation industry. The early Boeing company prospered, building seaplanes for the US Navy, then pursuit planes for the Army. But it was World War II that brought Boeing to the peak of success. The war was starting in Europe and uh, Wright Field put out an uh, order for uh, bids. For and in this, in, at this time, most of the airplanes were two-engine. We were still two-engine. Douglas was doing a two-engine bomber and uh, another company was doing a two-engine bomber. And uh, Boeing went in uh, to Wright Field and said, would this, would this procurement cover a four-engine bomber? And everybody just went berserk because nobody ever conceived of a four-engine bomber. This was the XB-15, a four-engine aircraft with a wingspan of 45 meters. It was so big, you could tunnel out through the wing and uh, you could come into the nacelle and you could make repairs in flight. A smaller version of this giant would become famous the B-17 Flying Fortress that would fill the skies during World War II. I think they ordered 13 or 14 uh, what they call test airplanes and that led to the Flying Fortress. I don't remember exactly how many were built, but it was around 13,000. And that airplane then went through the A series, B series, C series, all the way to H as I recall. I'd say the uh, story of the B-17 was it was such a versatile airplane was able to to keep carrying more, more bombs, more turrets. As American men went to war, women built airplanes. Thousands of women took up the slack in the workforce and helped boost production at Boeing from 60 planes per month in 1942 to an astounding 362 planes per month by March 1944. The B-17 was followed in 1942 by the B-29 Super Fortress. In Wichita, farmhands, housewives and shopkeepers built B-29s on 10-hour shifts, day and night, during what later became known as the Battle of Kansas. World War II transformed the uh, fortunes of the Boeing Company. Uh, before that, it was a serious manufacturer, but planes were built in small numbers. World War II meant Boeing was producing vast numbers of giant bombers on huge assembly lines. After World War II came the B-47, America's first jet bomber. And on April the 15th, 1952, Boeing test pilot Tex Johnston made the first flight with the B-52, which was to dominate the skies for the next 50 years. Then, Boeing took a gamble. In the 1950s, Boeing was doing quite well in military contracts for the B-47 and the B-52 bombers. But no aircraft company you know, can afford not to look ahead because it takes a long while to develop aircraft. And so they took a bold decision. They decided, well, let's take some of the profits from the bombers, some of that technology, and see if we could mix that into uh, a, an aircraft that passengers would want to use, that the airlines would want to buy. We had all the knowledge of the B-47 and the B-52, so it wasn't too big a job in the wind tunnel to develop a, a low-wing airplane that could be used as a tanker. And we, uh, we, 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 we knew they needed a tanker, so there had to be a tanker. And we hoped it could be a passenger airplane, although we weren't really sure that uh, that, that was the case. So that's why the Dash 80 was born. The Dash 80 took to the air under the control of Tex Johnston, who had flown the B-52. Johnston was determined to show Boeing had built a great plane. 
so he barrel-rolled the Dash 80 over the Seafair hydroplane course on Lake Washington on August 7, 1955. A maneuver that only nimble fighter aircraft usually do. Boeing's president, William Allen, was there to witness it. And Allen turned completely white, looked over at, these, uh, at his, uh, his technical advisor, Wellwood Beale, and he said, did we authorize that? And, and then just before he could turn around, uh, here he came back again and did it once more. Boeing's gamble paid off. The Dash 80 became the prototype for the KC-135, the first jet aerial tanker. And that turned into the Model 707, the first in a long line of Boeing commercial jet airliners. Boeing had done something clever with the 707. Using about one-tenth of the fuel, the $5 million 707 could carry as many transatlantic passengers a year as the $30 million Queen Mary Ocean Liner. Boeing had created a market and killed the passenger liner. In 1958, with the 707 entering service with Pan Am, Boeing set up a small group to concentrate on developing a supersonic passenger aircraft. By 1960, the company was spending over $1 million annually on the project. 